then the minutes of the uh, previous meetings of the uh, 13th of July um, and 14th of September, 23rd of November, I have down here. Does anybody wish to raise any objection to them being signed as correct records? Oh, was that a hand from you, Councillor Lilly? No, sorry. OK. Um, no, nope, I don't see anybody raising any any issues though, so I will therefore um, add them to the list of things to be signed when it can be physically possible. Um, any urgent business? Not for me, there isn't. Uh, anything by the committee clerk? I don't believe so. No, Chairman. No, nope. and public speaking time. I'm not aware of any public speakers today. No, Chairman, no public speakers. Then we go on to declarations of interest. Anybody like to uh, declare anything in particular pertinent to this meeting? And that's that's nobody. OK, so we'll go straight on to the first item. Uh, of business. There's two main items today. The first one is our investigation into the town deal board and the town investment plan. We've got with us today uh, Nathaniel Lucas. Uh, to tell us about that. There were certain key lines of inquiry, which I'm sure he'll address in his presentation. Now then we'll take questions from the, the committee. Over to you, Mr Lucas. Thank you very much and uh, thank you all for having me here today. Um, <clears throat> so I, I thought the, the best way to approach this is to um, kind of provide background uh, to the town deal process. Sorry, that was my cat. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry about that. The joys of working from home. Um, sorry, I'll start again. Uh, so yeah, so I thought I'd <laughs> take uh, um, uh, approach this in two ways. So uh, sort of go through the background to the fund um, and, and kind of the journey we've taken to to, to get to where we are today uh, with the submission uh, that took place at the end of January. Um, and then also, um, I thought it was a, a worthwhile um, uh, worthwhile to go through the town investment plan as well. Um, so if I just start by uh, kind of running through the background, so. Um, it's probably September 2019, um, Bridgewater uh, was uh, identified as one of the 101 towns um, to uh, be invited to, to submit a proposal uh, to the Town Deal Fund. Uh, the Town Deal Fund itself is um, about 3.6 billion, uh, with each town being able to make a submission up to 25 million. Um, what I will say, um, the enormity of the task in terms of us actually getting um, to, to, to January this year where we submitted has been uh, huge, especially in, in light of um, COVID-19 and, and, and the pandemic, um, you know, building uh, evidence bases and producing a strategic document to, to, to the uh, sort of scale and, and quality that, that, that I think we have done. There's been no uh, mean feat with probably hundreds of officer hours um, spent uh, in producing the submission for government. Um, so I thought what I'd do is I'd probably just sort of run through the the uh, kind of key milestones first off. Uh, the first of those, uh, well, after the announcement of the fund um, in September 2019, uh, December 2019, um, we were asked by government to submit a readiness checklist. And essentially what that was, was to define our intervention area uh, and also in, in addition to that, just kind of um, just confirmed that we were uh, essentially uh, wishing to go forward with the town deal. Uh, there's no reason why we wouldn't, if, I, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, then following that, uh, February 2020 was the formation of our town deal board um, and the ignorable meeting. Uh, the, the board itself um, it is made up of uh, a number of um, stakeholders uh, um, from across uh, sort of Bridgewater and the surrounding areas. Uh, the actual membership in the main was dictated to us by government. Um, and I won't go through every single uh, uh, board member or anything like that, but just just to say that it was uh, the majority of the membership was was um, dictated to us by government. So it included uh, all levels of local government um, from the area. So obviously county council, district council and uh, town council. Uh, also, um, we were asked to have representation from uh, the private sector. So uh, a large scale private sector organisation, which in this case was EDF. Uh, and also uh, representation from uh, your kind of small to medium sized enterprises. So in, in, in that respect, uh, we had representation from the Bridgewater Chamber, um, but also from the Federation of Small Businesses as well. Um, in, in addition to that, uh, we also had uh, a board member um, from Bridgewater and Taunton College uh, from an education skills perspective, which was Andy Barry, uh, and then uh, Somerset Community Foundation as well from a kind of a, a community element. But like I said, I, I won't go into all the board members, but but you know that, that that's just a flavour of the kind of the breadth of um, participation that, that that we've had um, within the Town Deal Board. 
uh, August, uh, sorry, in, in, um, in, yeah, sorry, in August 2020, uh, uh, we had our consultancy team approved, went through a procurement process to, to appoint them. Um, and this was on the basis uh, that uh, as part of the town deal process, government uh, provided us with what they classed as capacity funding uh, to deliver the town investment plan because, uh, you know, delivering such a, a large scale piece of work alongside um, uh, you know, from an economic development perspective, our day jobs and also uh, in light of the COVID pandemic and the support that we were providing to all of the, the, the businesses across the district, you know, it, it simply it wasn't feasible. And, and the fact that government provided that funding is a recognition to that as well. So, so through that funding, like I said, we, we, we uh, appointed our consultancy team. Um, uh, and then fr from that point on, uh, things really sort of picked up pace uh, in, in terms of the delivery of the, the town investment plan and the process that we went through. Um, further on into August 2020 as well, um, we were um, put for, well, it was identified by government in light of COVID that um, uh, towns that were in the town deal uh, could access what they class as a, uh, accelerated funding. Um, depending on the size of the, the, the town, uh, depending on the, the pot of funding that you receive. Uh, in Bridgewater's case, it was uh, 750,000. Uh, as with most government um, funding proposals and, and, and uh, kind of processes, the timescale was exceptionally short. So we were quite hamstrung in terms of what we could put forward. Uh, however, I, you know, we went through a, a, a process of, of highlighting um, a variety of different projects. There was three in the end. Um, one was the Meads. Uh, the second one was uh, some public public uh, realm regeneration uh, in the centre of Bridgewater, which was Clare Street. And the final one was the Northgate Leisure Scheme. Um, just based on the basis that there was extremely tight timescales to deliver um, or, or spend the monies, uh, the, the only scheme that we could find that kind of matched the criteria and also could deliver that spending in that very short time frame was Northgate. So uh, put our proposals forward for Northgate um, to government, uh, which was signed off. Um, and then in September, we were awarded um, the accelerated town deal funding uh, to go towards the Northgate scheme as well. So that was that was a, a, a quick win. Uh, but 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 something that's really successful enabled the, the scheme to move forward. Uh, uh, in September 2020, um, as part of the uh, town deal board work, uh, a visioning workshop took place, um, and that really focused on kind of the, the strengths, um, weaknesses, uh, opportunities, and threats. You know, as that kind of normal sort of SWOT analysis for for Bridgewater, and from that came the um, the, the strategic I can't say it, sorry the strategic aims um, for the uh, Bridgewater town deal. Um, what I'll do, I'll, I'll cover those off in more detail a bit later on, but it's safe to say that, you know, that they, they are um, three strong themes which, are, which link in with the overarching themes of the town deal itself. So, yeah, again, a, a, a success which was also su um, supported uh, by, um, sorry, my cat is getting my feet now. I'm so sorry. Just, get off. Sorry. Just, got to, just bear with me two seconds while I just shut my cat out. I do apologise for this. Sorry. To, uh, just to emphasize that no animals have been harmed in the production of this video today. Thank you. Sorry, I do a, a, a very apologetic about that. Animals. It's OK, we've sent the RSPCA around. It's, yeah, well, yes, you'll, fi you'll, you'll find the cat. Well, I would say I'd put the cat outside, but she's a house cat, so she doesn't go out. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Anyway, apologies about that. Um, so October, November, um, we did uh, a community uh, engagement and project prioritisation process. Um, so uh, one of the fundamentals to the town deal process um, for government was that there was uh, community and business engagement. You know, they really wanted it to be owned. Uh, as much as possible by, um, by by local people and businesses within the area. Uh, um, again, I will go to this more detail later on. But but clearly, this you know it, it was a difficult process in light of COVID. Um, but you know we, we did as much as we could, given the situation that we were in. Uh, and then December 2020, uh, the draft um, town investment plan was produced, which is the the culmination of the work, which is uh, what's submitted to government um, in January. Um, the uh, draft was submitted to government and their advisors for a kind of, a, I think, what they class as a check and challenge. Um, and this, uh, the, the draft was received very well. Um, they were really impressed with what we produced. Uh, that with, as with any kind of document, there were tweaks that needed to be made, uh, a bit of tidying up in various different areas, which they felt was weak. But on the whole, a very well received um, strategic document. And then January 21, 
um, we, we submitted on the 29th of January the, the, the plan to government. Um, so th that's kind of a whistle stop tour in terms of key milestones. Um, but what I will do is just go into a little bit more detail about some of the areas that I've covered. So the, the objectives of the funds itself, um, there, are, there are three main objectives which have been fed down from government. So the first one being urban regeneration, planning and land use. Uh, and this really focuses on uh, ensuring that towns are um, a thriving place to work for people to put off for people to live and work. Um, the, the second objective is around skills um, and enterprise infrastructure. Uh, so that's around ensuring that individuals have got the right skills to take advantage of opportunities um, in, in the present and, and going forward as well. But it's also about small business development and kind of fostering that entrepreneurial spirit as well. So for startup businesses. And then the final um, objective is uh, connectivity. So that there's two um, streams to that. The first one is around uh, transport connectivity um, and, and the, the, the second area is around sort of digital connectivity as well. Um, so I, I referenced the strategic aims um, that, that we um, produced uh, in, in September last year. So just to just to give you an indication of what they were as well. So um, again, you'll be able to see the links with the overarching objectives from the town bill. But the first one is around uh, maximising community potential, which kind of which ties in with the the employment and skills element. Uh, and so that's around ensuring our residents uh, are equipped with the right skills to be able to take advantage of new employment opportunities. Um, but in, in addition to that, like I said previously, it's about um, empower, being empowered to start your own business as well and that whole entrepreneurial spirit. Um, the, the second aim is around re-energising the town centre. So how, how it was, um, quite, as, a, as a kind of um, a, a way of describing it, I quite like this, it was, this Bridgewater was described as a donut. Um, so in the sense that uh, the outside of Bridgewater is, is benefited greatly from investment. Um, so you've got the, the the retail park and and other such investments, but the, the centre itself has 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 not seen that type of investment, which is clearly reflected in um, you know the town centre itself and the main high street and the main shopping drag. Um, so so that that was identified as a, as a, as a major concern, um, which is is why that strategic aim came to to a head, and it was really about stimulating greater diversity and activity in the town centre itself, and by doing that, it will attract. Uh, more people into the town centre and by then by doing that obviously you know you will attract more more um, shops and more diverse uses and, and then so the cycle continues to to, to kind of re-energise the town centre itself and then the, the the final strategic aim is um, accessibility and movement um, so we did a, a significant amount of research and um, evidence uh, gathering to, to to look at uh, different elements so um, I refer back to the the overarching um, aim from government about digital connectivity. Now for Bridgewater, um, I happen to think that the um, connectivity is, is pretty good through connecting Devon and Somerset in the first instance and also through BT Zone um, commercial rollout. But we, we were party to information uh, also about um, another uh, alt-net provider, Jurassic Fibre, which has got a pretty uh, aggressive um, full fibre rollout in Bridgewater. So in that sense, we felt comfortable that um, from a digital connectivity perspective, Bridgewater was pretty well pr pretty well served and, and we didn't think there was a need to invest further public se sector funding into that as well, just to simply duplicate. But what we did think was that then there's a need for a better connected um, Bridgewater from a transport perspective. So um, so that that's in the sense of in the locality, um, but also across a wider area as well. Um, and, and one of the things we we really felt, especially in, in view of the climate change emergency, is around sustainable transport options. And you see as we go through into the, the different types, of, the different projects that were submitted, you, you'll see those links there as well. Um, I talked about the public consultation as well. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any graphs or charts to be able to show you. But what I can tell you is um, there were 300, uh, sort of circa 320 uh, respondents um, from the community and business engagement. Um, and in, in terms of uh, some of the questions we asked were around what are the strengths of Bridgewater? Um, no surprises, Bridgewater Carnival came out on top with up to probably it's about 200 people felt that that was a, a significant strength. But in addition to that, the college was also considered a, a, a strength for Bridgewater um, and Bridgewater's positioning as well from a strategic perspective. So, uh, you know, we, we're right next to the M5, uh, we've got two motorway junctions. Uh, so fr from that sense, it, we felt, you know, it, essentially it was considered to be um, the gateway to the southwest, um, I think is how we kind of reframed it. 
Um, second uh, useful and interesting part of the um, consultation was around actual support for the strategic aims as well. So we um, obviously through the, 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 the working session created the strategic aims, but we put that out, that out into the consultations just to get people's views on those as well. And uh, all hugely uh, supported. So, you know, of the, of the 300 and odd 20 um, respondents, uh, you know, in terms of maximising community potential, I would say it's probably in the region of 270, 280 people responded saying they totally agreed or, or agreed with um, that as a strategic aim. Uh, along with uh, re-energising the town centre as well, again, you probably, it's 270-ish again, um, either totally agreed or agreed, and, and, and the same sort of figure as well in terms of sustainable access and movement around the town centre. So, you know, that, that was really encouraging to see that that, that you know that, that we were heading in the right direction in terms of what what Bridgewater needed from a kind of strategic perspective. Um, what else was quite interesting that was um, of, of the uh, responses that were had back. Um, a, a very whizzy um, program who I have to say I don't know the, the name of, but essentially created what is called a word cloud, and it drew out all of the kind of repetition in kind of keywords or phrases. Um, and this this was really interesting um, work that again you will see the links with the wider projects um, that, that have gone into the into the um, town investment plan as well. So, for instance, some of the the, the kind of the re repetition in terms of um, phrases and words were around um, revitalising the town centre, um, uh, anti-social behaviour, um, greater potential for individuals. So the, a, a broad cross section. Um, the docks was in there as well. Um, you know, a, attracting businesses. So all all of those all of these things, along with the the different feedback we had, kind of you know, fed into the mixing pot, I suppose, that we um, we carried forward as we as we um, you know uh, de devised the projects and so on. Uh, in terms of the, I won't go into detail of the project just yet, I will save that for later on, but I just thought it was quite interesting to understand the kind of the scale of the submissions that we received as well. So I think all in all, we've probably had over, we had over 25 project proposals um, from a wide variety of sources. Um, of the ones that actually had costs attached, because they didn't all have costings attached, some of them were, um, weren't developed as, as much as we would have liked. Um, they're probably in the region of over £40 million worth of projects. Um, which, you know, with a £25 million um, ceiling um, makes for some difficult decisions. Um, but in order to be able to do that and to be able to be fair to everyone, you know, all, all of the projects were judged on um, uh, consistent sort of uh, criteria for the projects to be selected. Um, I, again, I, I won't go into all of the criteria. I don't, I don't in, in, you know, I'm absolutely happy to, but I, I don't want to kind of get bogged down in it. But sort of some of the, the, the key um, criteria that we measured against were um, so around sort of how it fitted with the, the town deal's overarching aims and also our strategic aims, uh, how it responded to the baseline issues and the kind of the challenges within Bridgewater, um, the ability for the projects to be able to be delivered. Um, you know, is it a value for money project? You know, what, what does it actually deliver? Uh, and also the golden golden thread as well. So um, government were very keen that there was a kind of a golden thread that binded it all together, that kind of ran through the town investment plan, um, but also linked all of those projects together as well. So um, yeah, re re really important to, um, to, to to you know to be fair in terms of judging the ju judging the projects. And, and again, it wasn't an easy process, I, I, I will admit, but like I said, we we picked some strong projects I think to carry forward as well. Uh, like I said, I will go into the projects themselves, but I just thought it's worth understanding what the next steps are. So, like I said, we, 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 we've we submitted the town investment plan on January the 29th. Uh, that's gone to government. The next steps from our perspective is um, we, we wait for government to produce the heads of terms. Uh, and what that will be is that will be a document from them um, confirming the projects that we're able to take forward and the um, in principle allocation of money we've got for those particular projects. We revised that that would take um, sort of two to three months. So we're expecting something sort of March, April time. Uh, I know we're quite close to Perda. I would hope that it happens before then, but we wait to see, we, we wait and see what happens. Um, and, you know, the government have got a lot on their plate at the moment, so it's a case of just um, sitting tight, I think, unfortunately. Um, once we've had the uh, heads, of, heads of terms back from government, we then move into the um, full business case stage. So any, any project that's been carried forward by government into the heads of terms, we then have 12 months to produce full business cases um, for each project, uh, which we we can then submit to government, um, uh, and um, we also have the ability to sign off some of those um, ourselves with some support from government. 
Um, what we can do is that, well, what you'll notice as, we, as I go through the actual list of projects is that some projects are much more advanced than others. Um, we can submit projects when they're ready, essentially as part of a full business case. We don't have to wait till they're all done. So over that 12 month period, we'll be submitting various projects at different speeds throughout that 12 month period. Um, in terms of uh, the um, government and go governance and the management of the delivery, um, we are we're looking at those at the moment. Um, clearly, the, the Bridgewater Town Deal Board has a big part to play in it. Uh, we, we see uh, the Town Deal Board as uh, having kind of overall ownership of the um, delivery and strategic direction, uh, or also ownership of the heads of terms agreement as well. And then finally, to support and strengthen the relationship um, with government and other delivery agencies, but also to be able to kind of promote the Town Deal, um, you know, the Bridgewater Town Deal going forward as well, and really garner that support that we need. Uh, in addition to the Town Deal Board, uh, Sedgemoor District Council itself um, is the account well, will be the accountable body for the project. That is something that has been uh, dictated to us by government, so that 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 is the role for the District Council, um, and and that role will include, but is not exclusive to, uh, admin support to the board itself, um, to act as the accountable body, uh, to provide technical management um at, at the full business case stage to support in the development of the full business cases and uh, also provide technical management on the delivery of the project as well but also working in partnership with the other project leads as well um and then finally um it, it, in addition to the uh search more in the, the town deal we recognize that you know the number of projects that we're hoping to take forward um we, we've we've kind of subdivided those into a number of different groups as well um and, and that will become a bit more clear as i as i run through the projects themselves but essentially um we have a, a infrastructure projects group which will focus on uh, probably three or four projects um a uh, animating town center or, or i suppose you could class it as the regenerating the town center um group as well and then finally a strategic regeneration um project group um and that will focus on kind of some of the big bigger ticket projects but also um as i said we not all of the projects could go through because there wasn't enough funding available to be able to do that so we recognize the need to develop projects that couldn't make it through for whatever reason um, especially in light of um the the government announcements in the budget around the leveling up fund community regeneration fund and also the um shared prosperity fund which is supposedly coming uh, to fruition um later on this year or sort of early next year as well uh, so that's a rundown of the kind of the history and and, and where we've got to um in in terms of um the, the process itself I, I, what i was going to do is um, run through the town investment plan summary document and then actually go through the projects that they've gone forward into the tip as well but before i do that i just wanted to give you an opportunity to ask any questions that anyone might have uh okay we can we can do it that way i mean uh People are, are very aware, looking at the history of this, that there have been criticisms of the uh, whole project in the first place. And uh, that's not especially our remit here today. We want to know about the implementation and the opportunities. It, it's just uh, obviously well known that the project came about uh, in autumn 2019, just before the election, and uh, focused on Brexit uncertainty just before Brexit and uh, picked out 600 towns of which 100 were chosen. They turned out to be uh, government marginals, but I'm sure there's nothing uh, missing any of that kind of uh, situation. And now that you have mentioned yourself, of course, we're coming up to with the PERDA period and local government elections and another announcement is about to be made. I'm sure there's nothing amiss about any of that. I'm sure that uh, we all welcome being here with this money, no matter where it's come from in the first place. Not, not to mention that uh, a town deal uh, has very little input from towns but mainly the rural in uh, surrounding districts uh, i think that's just general background we're looking at implementation how it's worked in sedgemore are there questions from nathaniel at this point before his next part of the presentation um councillor hendry's put something here is that a statement councillor hendry or do you wish to comment no he's given his apologies i think okay any questions at this point councillor revens Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm interested in the description of Bridgewater and West Somerset possibly being a marginal uh, constituency. Uh, Councillor Smedley, I, 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 maybe a cephalogical analysis might have a different conclusion. Um, however, um, I, just a just a couple of points. I mean, I possibly take issue with you, Mr. Chairman, on the on the um, 
on the Bridgewater, whether it's Bridgewater centric or not, because I think the the difficulty that I think uh, some people had with it was that the uh, democratic input was very much from Bridgewater Town Council and the towns and parishes in the whatever might you mystically call it the Greater Bridgewater area weren't um, weren't fully engaged with with, with this and uh, I think there was possibly something amiss there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in the description of Bridgewater as a donut. Um, I, I, I would. Um, I, the only jam in the middle, I would suggest, is a traffic jam, but, um, <laughs> but that's, uh, that's perhaps, uh, perhaps for, for another time. Um, I just wonder whether you had any reflections on, on whether we might have done things better and how might we have engaged the wider Bridgewater area um, in uh, at the early stages. I get the sense that this is this has been a little bit rushed and possibly by by the government timetable, not a not a criticism. Is are there any lessons to be learned about how we have things on the shelf that we can put forwards as um, as a response to to um, government funding initiatives be coming up in this way as they now appear to. Mr Lucas. So um, in terms of your, your first point, um, Bill, uh, it, it, about engagement, uh, certainly um, the, the efforts were made to engage with the wider parishes. So I, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have the um, uh, the intervention area to hand now. Um, but, you know, that, that was essentially defined uh, by government in terms of what was covered. But you're absolutely right. There is a recognition that, it, you know, it sits outside of just the town council and there are the other uh, uh, um, parishes uh, uh, around Bridgewater. Like I said, we, we certainly try to engage with them. And for whatever reason we i don't want to say fell on deaf ears but there was a, a distinct lack of engagement that came forward and it wasn't until you know very much near the end that um that the, the other parishes kind of came on board and and certainly we, we held um uh, engagements with uh, with the, with the wider parishes as well uh, we had we only had one but that was just purely on the basis that we had tried to engage on a number of occasions and it had kind of drawn a blank really which was, was which was disappointing because clearly you know it it absolutely, it sits just outside of the town council. You, you're, you're absolutely right. Bridgewater is bigger than that. I, I would agree with you 100. Um, percent But but that was a situation we were faced with at the time, unfortunately. Um, in terms of your, your second point around um, lessons learned and projects on the shelf, I, I would agree 100. Um, percent And that's certainly something we're carrying forward. And, and like uh, you know, I listed off the um, you know different funds uh, that there was certainly the uh, leveling up fund that, that, that was announced in the in the budget um you know we would be looking to uh, certainly within the you know the the service area that i work in you know potentially take forward some of the projects that didn't make it through um to the town deal process for whatever reason um, I, I think you're right that um that that it, I, I don't think it was rushed um you know the the, the end product is a, is a strong quality product uh, I, I would, you know, uh, argue that's a blue in the face, but, you know, we weren't able to put some of the projects through because we didn't have the time to be able to finesse them, I would suggest. Um, and there are some key projects that I'm sure you're all aware of around Bridgewater that we would we would have liked to have been able to kind of to, to, to bring into the town investment plan. But having said that, they, they now have the time to be able to be developed um, in a bit more detail. And I, I'd like to think that they are potential projects that, have been, that can be taken forward for the levelling up fund, the community regeneration fund, or even further beyond that, the um, uh, the shared prosperity fund as well. So, yeah, so I, I, I don't disagree with you, Bill. Um, um, but I think we're stronger for having gone through the process is what I will say. And, and it makes us better for the future going forward. In, you want to just yeah, just as a follow up. Thank you, thank you for your, for your response. And I, uh, yeah, uh, the, when I said rush, I didn't mean the, the what we were putting forward was of any, any in any sense so, substandard in terms of quality. Mm -hmm. I meant the whole process, and this is probably the same for every every council that's going through this in the country. And that necess doesn't necessarily reflect the strategic need for a project. It reflects what's what's easily deliverable mm -hmm. and therefore the need the need might, might, might not be there the next question really is well how do we get projects onto the shelf have we uh, have we missed the boat in terms of because you've mentioned that you're fin you're finessing some of the projects that didn't make it so that they would be um i was about to use the phrase oven ready but that's probably, probably <laughs> worse um, um that they would be ready to to to, to be submitted but there are certainly mm. projects that may not have been been submitted that would that would be 
of great importance strategically for the area mm -hmm. um, that that I, I think um, local communities would like to see put forward. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I don't think there's a set way of doing that. I mean, if, if there are specific, um, you know, projects that people are aware of, then, you know, I absolutely have to be a conduit to take that forward, because I'm not saying that, you know, a, a, as a service area, we've got all the answers by any means, I, you know. Um, so if there if there are projects, I mean, what I would what I would recommend is looking at the criteria um, for the different funds that are coming up. So the levelling up fund, the community regeneration fund, um, there are some intricacies within them that make them quite technical. Um, I would say that um, that beyond I, I this and this is just my personal view, and I think this is something that we'll, we'll work on, you know, um, as an organisation. But it's projects that are for for the locality, but I think they need to, in order to kind of gain traction, they need to look beyond that as well. So I haven't. This is just a, an example that I'm making up off the top of my head. But say, for instance, I don't know, a, a project that could that was, you know, Sedgemoor focused, Bridgewater focused, whatever we want to say, where, you know, whatever way we're talking about within Sedgemoor, um, but actually um, that delivers wider benefits to a, a county level and a regional level as well. So something maybe, I don't know, tourism has taken a big hit recently. Something that supported that would, you know, would go a, a long way because I think, you know, whilst we need to be focusing on ourselves to, to gain that extra traction with government, you know, you need to be able to show that wider, wider value as well. Does that does that answer your question, Bill? Yes, it does. Thank you very much, Nathaniel. I, do, I just wonder whether there needs to be some sort of clearer route in for projects to take to come up from the community, um, and that that's possibly you know, a, a bigger question. That need, if this is the way the government's going to fund things, then then we need to need to need to get these projects on the shelf in some way, and maybe a, maybe a structure rather than um, would would be advisable in in the future. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is the way it's going um, from a government perspective. I, I can't say for definite because I don't know what's coming with the shared prosperity fund, but certainly for the two that have, yeah, exactly. Certainly for the two that have, um, you know, that come out through the the, the the recent budget, then then that that appears to be the way that it's going. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, thank you. I'd just like to correct Councillor Evans' earlier misconception. I wasn't suggesting that Bridgewater uh, was a marginal. That's why the government had picked on this, because clearly uh, Mr Little Granger is the most popular MP since King Alfred the Great, who had an equally sizable majority. I'm sure there was no uh, thought about that. They couldn't possibly have had 100% of marginal seats involved in this. So the 99% they had, probably enough. I'm sure Bridgewater wasn't chosen for that reason. And as regards to town, uh, dominance in this. There's only one town councillor on that board, I would say. Uh, so, Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Nathaniel. Um, just a few questions. It just occurred to me while you were talking, as a, as a town councillor and as a, a member in which at least one of the project, well, some of the projects are included, I wondered if some of us needed to declare a personal interest, but I take advice on that. Um, but my other questions are, um, you mentioned the time that you are expecting or hoping for a response from government about the, about the agreeing the heads of terms. Can you just let me know, was it the original tension for the original bid to be submitted in October and in fact it went in in January? It was only asked because a few weeks ago there was a, a tranche of projects that the government had uh, um, published the heads of terms and so we looked excitedly at that and then realised that Bridgewater wasn't one of them. It's just um, with Perda coming up, how, how confident are you that there will be a response before Perda and if it doesn't come through, have you any idea of the timescale it might be? And um, is the is, is the bid, is it for capital projects only or does it include revenue? Because I um, noted that you included that um, admin uh, support and technical management was included within the bids. Did I understand that correctly to help communities build the bids that will then go through to the next stage? OK, um, my question. Thank you. OK, uh, right. So um, the first one was around the submission date. Um, and so uh, originally, yes, we had intended to um, submit uh, earlier in the well, I say earlier in the year, in, in the previous year, um, in 2020. Um, but we just felt that there was more value uh, 
in in taking that extra bit of time to to as I said I've used this word a lot but finesse the projects that we were going to be submitting you know making sure that they were the right projects to submit and and they were at the at the right level um, like I said when I was kind of providing the history of the town the, the town deal process you know it, it was no mean feat you know there was a lot of officer hours and um, consultancy time put into its development and and to kind of to, to rush it I, I think would have been a, a travesty if, if we if you know to not be able to secure as much money as as possible from the process itself but you are right some towns were announced um, previously in fact some towns were even announced previously to last month as well um, depending on what tranche you went into but there are I think something like well in in January uh, when the submission was done there was 40 uh, 44 towns submitted in, in January um, so there is still a significant amount of um, of towns still to hear something and even some of the the towns that submitted earlier than than we did have still not had their responses yet either so you know I, I quite how the government are doing it I don't know I like to think it would be alphabetized from our perspective because we do quite well then um, but you know we, we shall see um, and then you asked about the time scales as well. Um, so the honest answer is I don't know. Um, if it doesn't if it doesn't happen before Perda, I, I I honestly don't know. I have I can assure you I've been chasing MHCLG um, and trying to trying to kind of wheedle it out of them uh, with my contact there, but um, they are staying stum at the moment. So we will we will hear when we hear. Unfortunately, uh, the sooner the better. I hope, but like I said, I, I can't I can't say because I don't know. Uh, and then um, you talked about capital and revenue funding. The majority of the um, the ask is capital, and that was uh, that was set out by government. Um, there is a small element of revenue funding um, with, within the project submissions. Um, it's not so. I, I'm not sure if uh, you were possibly getting muddled but so there was capacity funding that was given to get given by government to us to be able to um to, to deliver the town investment plan and then the bit the full business cases as well and it was that money that was used um to you know for engagement with the, the communities and the build-up to producing the tip but like i said there, there is an, a small element element of revenue funding um contained within the actual town investment plan as well beyond you know your, your kind of tangible bigger ticket capital kind of spend all right. Does, does that answer your questions? That's OK. Is it OK, Councillor Filmer. Thanks, Chairman. It was just a couple of things, really. First one is is just a almost an admin thing as much as anything. We've had a lot of information, Nathaniel, which has been really helpful mm -hmm. um, and more to come. Um, but from a scrutinising point of view, it would be mm -hmm. helpful if we could have something before the, the meeting that we can at least look at to sure. then bring to the meeting um because otherwise there's there's an awful lot of facts you're sending to us and and taking those all in and coming back with questions is 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 not straightforward mm -hmm. um on the on the actual things itself um you mentioned um well you you said that you got you'll go through the projects in a moment i wonder if you could just give me some idea as to in terms of the projects how have we done them in in the sense that they can have measurable outcomes that they can be monitored and, and reported back and how does that actually work mm -hmm. you seem to say i think that the town deal board would probably be where that goes to but that sedgemore is the accountable body which i sound almost like the admin was sedgemore so all mm -hmm. i was wanting to ask also was in the whole process where's the democratic accountability in terms of monitoring what happens with this where does where does that sit and how's mm -hmm. that reported and how can we hold it to account OK, um, so in answer to those, in answer to those specific questions, well, firstly, apologies for not providing something ahead. Um, you know, absolutely. Uh, I'm sure there'll be further meetings around the subject, so I'm more than happy to provide something uh, ahead. Um, in in terms of um, the monitoring and kind of from a from a democratic perspective as well, um, we're, we are working that up at the moment in, until we get um, uh, the heads of terms from government. We don't know what projects we're going to be taking forward, but you know, from from, from the district council's perspective, uh, as accountable body, we would be the intermediary for the funding element of it. So government essentially will be giving us the funding. Now, some of the projects we would be kind of overseeing from our own for ourselves, from our own perspective, but other projects we'd be working with partners as well. So. Uh, it, again, it depends what projects go through in terms of how it works, but there absolutely would be, um, you know, uh, from a democratic perspective, uh, decisions that would need to be would need to be taken. Um, and, and like I said, we're, we're just we're not quite there with that yet, but we, we're certainly kind of building up how that's going to work. Um, you know, that, that, that there'll certainly be a case for, um, you know, if we're giving out millions of pounds, well, not giving out, should I say, but you know, distributing 
um, you know, money to partners, then there will be funding agreements in place to, to be able to protect the district council as a accountable body. And there will also need to be decisions taken in terms of is this a viable project? Does the business case stack up and all those sorts of elements as well? So you're right, absolutely. There, that is something that we need to recognise um, and that is something that we are developing uh, as we speak. OK. OK. And of course, in terms of democratic accountability, there have been a couple of elections in the meantime, which the government still managed to win, despite promising all that money. They didn't even write it on the side of a bus. Uh, but no money has actually been uh, delivered yet, really. I said not all that 25 million is necessarily going to be delivered either, is it? It could just be some form of um, promise. Is that not the case? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't. Well, we, we haven't had any of the 25 million yet. We've, we've had capacity funding. Um, to kind of get us to that stage. Um, we're also um, um, in the process of securing a second tranche of capacity funding from government as well, um, just with the recognition that um, it's a costly process to produce business cases, you know, so the government have recognised that the, that the capacity funding that we've got, and certainly we've, us, um, Sage Moore, and I'm sure all of the other 101 towns have fed back saying, you know, on top of our day jobs, you know, this simply isn't enough money for us to be able to deliver what you need in order to be able to access that money. So I tend to think, and this this has only recently just happened, so I tend to think there is a commitment from government. Certainly, you know, there has been, um, I'm not sure how many, I can't do the maths now, but, you know, a lot of towns have already basically received their town deal funding um, as a, a kind of a heads of terms, uh, an in-principle agreement. Um, I, I see, and, and they've, they've all been, um, you know, um, allocated, you know, significant sums of money, you know, tens of millions, I, I would suggest. Uh, I see no reason why why Bridgewater wouldn't be in the same position uh, as well. Like I said, you know, the, the, the feedback we had from government was really positive uh, in terms of the submission. So I can't say for definite because I don't I, I don't I don't have that crystal ball to be able to say. But, you know, certainly I was encouraged by what the feedback that we received to date. OK, okay now, the, uh, before you go to the second part, is anybody else wants to ask a question at, at this point? No? OK, do you want to uh, move on to the next part of your presentation, Mr Lucas, please? Sure, absolutely. So just bear with me two seconds and I will endeavour to put it up on the screen so everyone can see it. Um, just bear with me. Right. Uh, yeah. can, I, can everyone, can you see that? Can everyone see that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, excellent. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so like I said, th this is the um, Town Investment Plan summary document. So Town Investment Plan itself is the strategic doc document which kind of sets out Bridgewater's ask um, and, and uh, included within it is uh, like an evidence base and uh, the project, how we reach those conclusions, the community engagement, all those sorts of things that um, that the, the, the government asked for essentially to, to kind of to, to put our bid in to, to, to them. Um, as I said previously, the the the, the full plan itself is a, a, a berm off of a, um, a a document. It's huge, especially with its appendix as well attached. Um, so with the recognition that there was information that we, we we just didn't want to put into the public domain as yet, um, because obviously we haven't had projects signed off or anything from government, um, we um, produced a the summary plan, which is this here. Um, just with a view that we wanted to be able to give uh, the public and stakeholders and everyone an idea of, of, of kind of how things have worked, where we're going, what, what projects are involved and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so so this is the front page. Um, you know, it's re reflective of um, Carnival, um, you know, re-energising town centre, all those sorts of things. Uh, and this, this is the actual the, the same cover as um, uh, what, what was in the the, the full plan itself? Um, I, I won't go through everything. I'll just say so. I, I will skip to what what I think is probably the most the most important parts. But um, I'm absolutely happy to forward this on if people aren't a, a, haven't been able to access it themselves. So do not fear. You do not. You don't worry about kind of reading through it now. I, I can circulate it if, if necessary. Um, so what what I think is, is particularly interesting is it sets out the challenges and opportunities. Um, for the town itself. Um, so, you know, th th this mirrors some of the stuff that I went through in, in the previous presentation. So in terms of um, the strategic positioning, you know, that was considered a real strength, the, the M5 transport corridor, uh, it's um, it's industrial heritage, you know, Bridgewater is historically a town of, of um, kind of doers and, and, and makers. Um, so that, you know, again, that's something that we, we, we've tried to focus on in, in terms of the plan, you know, focusing on its heritage and its, and its culture. 
Um, you know, here as well, we talked about the um, the cultural identity for Bridgewater, and that's really strongly linked with the, the carnival. Um, but also, when, when we go through the projects themselves as well, you, you you see there is that real strong link with culture itself, and that that's really just about um, again I touched on this earlier on, but it's about diversifying the town centre. You know, in, in, in increasing the footfall, getting people back into the town centre, and 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 providing that that different offer for them to to want to come here. And and um, like I said, Northgate. Uh, the, the the leisure scheme will, will go some way to doing that um but you know we, we want to go beyond that as well so again you, you you'll see that um uh, as i run through the projects themselves um you know that clearly that hpc is a is, is a, an opportunity everyone everyone is is aware of that as well um and, and then the, the natural environment as well so you know in terms of it's it's you know bridgewater and, and sagemore's positioning in terms of you know the quantock hills uh, you know the, the areas of outstanding natural beauty um, all, all, all play into the mix in terms of being able to um, to, to attract people to Bridgewater and that, that kind of wider offer as well. Um, if we just go down to the, the, the challenges as well so again you, you, based on my um, what I was talking about earlier on none of this should seem foreign to you really um, you know it's a, it's a need to level up the town itself um, so that's the, the analogy of the, the, the donut um, but I mean, I'm sure there's other ones as well. But you know, essentially, it's making sure that the town centre benefits from investment in the same way that the you know the the, the kind of the more of the outskirts of the of, of the town have benefited as as well. Um, create creating a vibrant and welcoming um, town centre. Uh, you know, again, that that's about the diversity of the town centre. It's about making sure that um, we create a, a high quality spaces. Um, you know, linking um, the the, the, um, the the different shopping areas together as well. So you know, you've got the primary centre, but you know the, those the, 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 those areas on the outskirts as well. So you know, the likes of East Reach uh, and and even the you know the, the retail park as well, ensuring that we are linking it all together. So it's one bigger offer. Um, uh, creating a well connected town centre and urban area. Uh, again, this, this goes back to that kind of whole connectivity piece as well. Um, you know that there there are uh, clearly um, you know short, shortcomings in terms of um, uh, and being able to get around the, the town itself and, and, and links to the wider area as well. Uh, so we, we we've tried to address that, uh, and, and again you'll see that in terms of the the, the sustainable transport projects that we've um, we, we've put forward. Uh, and then finally, strategic barriers to growth as well. So um, th th these are um, your kind of so probably your, your your big ticket items. So the um, the Bridgewater uh, barrier. Uh, that that, that's one one element of it. Um, Dumble, the Dumble Junction as well. But both of those projects have um, the, the significant impacts on on the ability for Bridgewater to be able to expand. Just in just in terms of um, being able to develop uh, land uh, land allocations for for housing and em employment space as well. They they really are um, you know th they have the potential to hamstring significantly. But also um, you know from a barriers perspective, also being able to protect growth in the town because obviously if it if the town's under Underwater due to climate change or anything like that, then you know it's quite difficult to um, to, to for it to, to grow and prosper. Um, just thought, just just worth running through the, um, the the Bridgewater vision as well. Um, so the, the vision is it's uh, our vision for Bridgewater is a town re-energized, uh, drawing maximum socio-economic benefit uh, from existing and future investment in clean energy and inclusive growth. Uh, in particular from the proximity of the Catholic projects such as Hinkley Point C and the 600 acre um, gravity smart campus as well. Bridgewater Re-Energise will be a town recognised as a place of education, enterprise and innovation, a town that is socially conscious, culturally rich, maximising its unique tapestry of cultural events spearheaded by its award-winning illuminated um, carnival. So, you know, that, that, that uh, well, I'd like to think, sums up um, Bridgewater in, in in a very very small um, amount of text and and all, everyone will always disagree in terms of you know is that the right vision for Bridgewater but you know it's certainly um, you know certainly in terms of looking to looking forward uh, I, I think it ticks the boxes um, so we talked about the um, the strategic aims all, all of, so these, these are the strategic aims here so you've got maximizing community potential re-energizing the town center um sustainable uh, access and movement and these are all hung off of these two um uh kind of uh, um, uh aims here so sustainable growth so that's focusing on you know clean growth clean energy um you know uh, hpc is, a, is a, a significant contributor to um to, to clean growth and and you know a, as gravity develops you know the whole kind of smart green campus that that will will, will develop even further and then inclusive growth in, in, sorry inclusive growth as well uh, and that's in the sense of 
um, you know, uh, again, it, it's providing people with the right skills so they can can access, um, you know, the, those uh, the, those new jobs uh, potentially from gravity or, or wherever else. But also about giving people the opportunity to, to develop their own businesses and that kind of that entrepreneurial spirit as well. Um, so the actual projects they got. So th this is a list of the projects. So um, j just to kind of give you the the headline. So. Uh, the, the the bid itself was for 25 million, the maximum that is, that is possible. Uh, one, one central to the um, town deal process from government's perspective was being able to leverage additional um, funding against the, the the town deal contribution from government, and we're really pleased um, that that we have uh, well, the total funding package, uh, including the the, the the town deal allocation, is uh, 160 million 800 thousand pounds, I think. So that that is you know a significant um a, amount of investment going into Bridgewater over the, or all being well that government signs everything off over the next uh sort of six six to seven years um and, and it says it right here as well so you know in terms of private sector match you know it's it's in the region of 24 million so you know a, a really great story for Bridgewater in terms of actual you know hard cash being invested into the um in, into the, the the town itself so the projects are as followed, and, and what, what's um, been done here is quite handy. So it's been um, uh, colour coded uh, just for ease of reading. So the the, um, the light blue ones are focused around unlocking growth. Um, so as, as I alluded to earlier, that's the the tidal barrier, uh, also protecting Bridgewater Town Centre, uh, and being able to unlock housing and employment growth. Uh, Dun Dumble Junction as well. Um, so so I should say as well, we're not paying for the whole barrier out of the town deal process. You know, it's, it's a contribution to be able to, to to draw down the rest of the money. Um, Dumble Junction uh, again is it, similar. So there's a, a a contribution from the the town deal process. Um, and again, it's it's about unlocking housing and employment land for development, which is currently um, hamstrung by um, uh, by the fact that you know any from Highways England perspective, any any um, future developments aren't allowed until, until we've addressed that issue. And then that whole kind of sustainable transport, um, you know, improving improving links around the town is um, around walking and cycling. So um, we, we essentially, we're you know, there's a recognition that through um, Hinkley and the Section 106 money, there's been an awful lot of investment into um, cycling and walking around the town. But the, but the, the, the town deal recognises there can there can be more as well. So it, it's making the the links and the connections between employment areas and uh, and, and and housing as well. So people don't have to re rely on uh, using cars to to, to to get around so again a, a really a really important um kind of element of the, of the town deal as well which which feeds into those strategic aims um places and spaces so um you've got the celebration mile which I'm, I'm certain that everyone's aware of um so specific projects within the celebration mile that we'll be focusing on is uh eastover um and and the ongoing um uh, plans around that um, in addition to Eastover, uh, there is uh, works around um, Clare Street to focus on pedestrianisation and, um, and and you know re really kind of bringing Clare Street in that area um, uh, alongside um, Angel Place, Angel Crescent um, up to uh, up to a similar level in, in terms of Celebration Mile kind of objectives. Um, within those two places as well, there's, there's a you know the, the aim to kind of create. Uh, additional workspace in those areas. So what was submitted to government was that we would, um, on, on the side of Angel Place, you've got the colonnades. Um, we, we would be looking to turn those into kind of small uh, kind of shops or in, in employment um, areas, but hopefully with a link to the college as well. So, you know, we can give um, students at the college the opportunity to be able to develop their own businesses in a, in a kind of a safe kind of trial environment, but also with a view to, you know, being able to attract bona fide businesses as well that already are kind of up and running. Um, project number five is around the restoration of the docks. Um, it, this is a huge project, <laughs> as I'm sure you're all aware, but, um, you know, it's, it's not just looking at the basin itself, it's the whole kind of docks, docks quarter as well, with a longer term view around creating kind of a leisure and tourism destination for the town. And again, you know, it's, it's, it's about diversifying um, the town centre and really being able to attract people back, back, back to that place as well. Um, and then finally, that the, the final category is about diversifying the town centre and um, and installing civic pride as well. Um, so there is a, a number of projects all around um, kind of, of cultural elements. So the art centre uh, is one of those. Um, so it's it's kind of bolstering the the, the offer that the art centre can have, and, and again being able to put on um, you know uh, a wider range of events, for local artists and cultural events. 
Um, Town Hall Theatre in, in, in a similar vein as well, um, you know, kind of, you know, rejuvenating the, the, the theatre itself, but also with a, um, a business slant to it as well. Uh, so um, the the, um, the development of office space in there um, and and the, the, the view would be that that's for kind of community social enterprises to be able to kind of access that as well. Uh, and then the engine room. Um, so as I'm sure you're aware, um, already a portion of funding has gone to support the um, uh, the, the, the engine room uh, to develop its services. But, you know, it's such a great project that, you know, the, the offer that they can provide can be enhanced even further than that. So, you know, around digital arts, media, um, but it's, it's that whole kind of skills piece as well, um, being able to support, um, you know, the, the residents of the town and, and wider to be able to, to access those, those, those higher level skills. Uh, Bridgewater Step Up. Um, is um, uh, essentially uh, the creation of uh, enterprise hub uh, or space uh, within the town centre it's, itself. Um, so it will be a kind of a creative space, um, re really with a view to be able to um, attract those individuals that potentially haven't had a chance to develop their own businesses and provide them with that support they need to be able to do so. Again, it's that kind of whole inclusive growth piece where you're, you know, you're supporting them on their journey to be able to develop their businesses. Uh, project number 10 is the, is the carnival. Uh, again, I'm, I'm pretty certain that most people are aware of that, but it's around um, sustainability of the carnival going forward. Um, obviously, there's the site um, on the uh, Bristol Road, um, which is, is in not in the best of conditions at the moment. But, you know, the aim is to um, develop the site, um, create a permanent home for carnival. Uh, that will enable it to future proof it to, to be able to, uh, to to attract people um to to carnival to kind of have that longevity in terms of um new young people um, but just just providing a, a better environment really for for, for the um carnival carts to be to, to be built year on, on on year and then the final project um which, which is um which i talked about earlier on is, is around that kind of um more revenue ask is is uh, town wardens and event ambassadors, and, and this this was really off the back of the fact that, that it came through so strongly uh, around now whether it's antisocial behaviour or the perception of antisocial behaviour, um, but but certainly you know if we're investing all this money in into the, the town itself, then we need people to feel that they are safe within the town, and 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 town wardens or event ambassadors are there to kind of steward people um, around for for events, but or you know also keep keep an eye to uh, antisocial behaviour that's going on, but but not simply just to um, you know to move individuals on or anything like that, but actually provide that kind of wraparound support for people as well. You know we're very conscious that it's not just a case of moving uh, a individual or a group of individuals onto the next town or something like that you know we want to be able to make a difference to their lives as well so you know that that that, that project itself will will really you know link in with what support services are already out there be a kind of signposting as well and and so on and so forth to to ensure that the, the, the town can benefit from all this investment and, and people you know come flooding back in their droves i, I suppose essentially um and then um this just just kind of maps out the actual um, kind of locations of the, um, the, the various different projects. Um, but what I'll just go on to now is, is in terms of um, delivery itself. What what this shows is actually it actually gives you a list. So I, I, I say I couldn't couldn't tell you off the top of my head all of the board members, um, but they are all, all um, here. So um, you can see that the mix is uh, also just, um, a member of parliament was also part of the town board. Um, the the uh, Heart of the South West LEP was a me uh, member of the board as well. Um, the uh, chief executive of the Bridgewater College Trust, uh, Network Rail. Um, oh, we had um, a pri private sector developer as well uh, in the form of Paul Edwards. Uh, the YMCA from a community perspective as well. Uh, and then finally, we had uh, Business in the Community, which is a, another kind of community based um, organisation as well. So, so that's a, a, just a, a quick kind of run through in terms of the um, the, the, the tip itself. Um, and like I said, happy to answer any questions, but also um, if, if people haven't had access to it, then um, more than happy to, to, to share that with people as well um, if, they, if they haven't been able to locate it. So like I said, happy to answer any questions. OK, thank you very much for that. I'm sure that uh, people would like to see a copy if they haven't already. Uh, are there any, is there anybody in the room who would like to ask a question to Mr Lucas on that uh, particularly full report? Um, I don't see any any hands being um, shown at the moment. So, so, so I, I would say then, Mr Lucas, thank you very much for doing that. It's a lot of hard work. And don't, don't take my earlier remarks as disparaging in any way. We'd, uh, if 
a big pile of money is handed out to us, I'm sure we'd take it. If the Chinese turned up with a big pile of money, we'd build a nuclear power station, I'm sure. Uh, or various <laughs> other or options, I'm sure, would, would be uh, uh, welcome. Welcome in this area, a town that's been deprived of so much uh, over the years, definitely needs it. You've outlined most of the things that we share in common from the town's perspective, and which, of course, benefit the whole district and the hinterland, including North Petherton. Now, um, so I, I think, uh, thank you very much for your, for your attendance today, and I'm sure we'd like to to, to note the, 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 the outcomes of that uh, report, unless people would like to suggest any other way forward in this. No, nope, I think, thank you for your time, and we'll, we'll note the findings of the report. Let's now move on to the next uh, item of business today, which is uh, is Mr. Tate, who is uh, going to talk to us about SIL funding. This is another welcome source of money we've had since about 2015, I'm sure. And uh, he'll tell us how it's been going and where it's going. Thank you. Mr. Tate, over to you. OK, and I shall try and share a short presentation. Uh, so. And you have to, if you let me know if that's on screen. We, we see nothing. Is, is uh, Steve in charge of sorting that out? That's uh, it may, sometimes it takes a little while to, uh, to come through. One moment. Just. Uh, there we have it. Yeah. OK, perfect. OK, so our, what I was just proposing to do was um, just take us through the, um, the, the four key lines of inquiry. And if it's helpful, I'll take a I'll, I'll stop when I've covered each individual item. So if um, if there's questions about stage um, and obviously at, at, at the end, if there's still more general questions, but it I, maybe that's that's a slightly easier way of doing it than me going through the whole thing because it's a little bit of a technical subject um at times certainly so um so just in terms of the um background um as was mentioned there we actually as a council we introduced it in april 2015 and that was very much on the basis that um we weren't able to continue to pull contributions from section 106 agreements for, for more than five developments so things like uh, pooling together contributions for sport and recreation and particularly the um, barrier would have been impossible had we not introduced SIL. Um, it's, I think probably most people are broadly aware, but it is a charge per square meter of additional floor space um, and it applies, as it says there, to certain development um, uses. And the way we introduced it was we undertook quite a detailed viability assessment looking at um, development across the whole of the district looking to see if there were different um, if some areas of district um, were more viable than others and we looked at different types of, of development so housing employment retail um, etc et um, and effectively through an examination we introduced um, it through a charging schedule which was adopted by council and it applies therefore to residential large retail development so that's the sort of quasi out of town or retail warehousing type uh, uh, retail um, and hotel development and those are the only categories that the evidence said would support the introduction of, uh, of, of sale at that stage. Um, we we do have two rates, or it was introduced as two rates. There was a, a view to try and keep things simple as well. Some authorities have very complex um, breaking their, their, their districts into, into multitudes of different charging areas. The, the evidence supported an urban and a rural rate. Um, and the, roughly speaking, although since it was introduced, it's, it's increased in, in value just due to it being indexed, but the urban rate was £40 per square metre and the um, rural, wake was, rural rate was £80 per square metre. Um, and as it says there, money raised through SIL um, used to help fund um, prioritise infrastructure that supports growth. It is um, 
it's a very regulated and complicated system um, and actually working your way through the regulations is 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 extremely challenging um, and it's also quite challenging for anyone that's going to be paying so as well and there's a number there are a number of exemptions included um, in the regulations um, so it's important to note that affordable housing is exempt from paying community infrastructure levy um, as is self-built housing um, when that was in introduced um, it's also paid on commencement of development um, and you have to serve various notices to let um, the council know when you're commencing development um, but in our case um, there was an option and we have we do include an installments policy so for larger sites it enables for the, the seal to be paid at various triggers into the development rather than it all being an, an upfront cost and again that was on the basis of the um, overall development viability um, then within SIL either 15% um, or 25% of the SIL receipts are um, transferred to um, parishes, well, parish and, or town councils. Um, the higher rate, the 25%, um, is for those parish or town councils where there is a made neighbourhood plan. Um, and that was very specifically introduced as encouragement um, on the one hand for um, for, for neighbourhood planning and in particular neighbourhood plans which were identifying growth in their in their areas therefore they would benefit um, from from the, the value from the seal raised from any of that growth. Um, town and parish councils have um, considerably greater flexibility on how they spend their what is called meaningful proportion. Um, it, it, in broad terms it, it has to be spent on something which mitigates the impact of development but there is no further guidance in the regulations on that um, it's always been envisioned and we've certainly always encouraged um, those that are producing neighbor plans to say well actually the neighbor plan is a really good vehicle for setting out what you would be spending your sale receipts on because it's an example to get through community engagement locally to identify the, the, the priorities um, and set them out in your neighbour plan. Some of our neighbour plans have gone have have, have done that. Um, I, I think it's fair to say it's in, in broad terms um, but perhaps not as many as, as we match perhaps might have hoped. Um, and it is still possible to have both community infrastructure levy sale and the section 106 agreements and when the system was first introduced um, there, there were very clear um, restrictions set out um, in the sense that you couldn't um, charge SIL and have a section 106 for the same item of in infrastructure um, but again Sedgemore we have continued to use section 106 agreements for certain forms and types of infrastructure development there are some authorities where absolutely everything is done under SIL and then just the last one just in terms of the background um, there have been quite a lot of amendments to the seal regulations I think it probably reflects the fact that it's so complicated um, and therefore has, has needed some adaptation and some flexibilities um, but the most significant changes were in 2019 because actually this removed the restrictions on being able to pool section 106 contributions so the very reason why we introduced it as i mentioned just a moment ago was that uh you you wouldn't under the regulations initially you couldn't pull from more than five section 106 agreements that has now been removed so that means that uh, you could have effectively tariff um approaches through section 106 agreements um so that's that's quite an important and quite big flexibility um it also now does allow you to, um, in some cases, if you if you have that situation, to use contributions from both SIL and Section 106, so to fund the same piece of infrastructure. Um, so again, quite a significant change. Um, and although I haven't referred to it on the slide, but there is no longer we we pick up when we talk about our infrastructure priorities, but the um, the the regulation 123 which was where an authority set out what it was going to spend its uh, seal on that regulation has also been um, uh, deleted so 
a, there is no longer a formal requirement to set out um, explicitly what you're what you're going to be prioritizing your SIL spend on. So there have been um, from from an officer point of view, we have started some initial work um, on reviewing how we might use SIL. Um, and have a, perhaps a greater role for Section 106 agreements. Now there is more flexibility, um, and particularly looking the, uh, at the, the broad concept that the larger sites actually securing infrastructure through Section 106 is, provides greater certainty and is more, in many cases, more straightforward, and perhaps you still um, for collecting contributions from smaller forms of development. Um, that's got as far as uh, I did report a paper to um, seen a leadership team probably about a year ago, um, but to be honest, we haven't progressed um, that work significantly due to quite a number of factors and other priorities. And also, as will be mentioned a little bit later on, um, potential changes to the planning system. Um, but that's just, um, that's just a few sort of slides on the background of, of, of SIL. Um, so I don't know if there were any questions at this stage or otherwise I'd go on to the next item. Okay, if anybody would like to ask any questions at this stage, could you indicate in the chat box? Because I can't see all the, uh, the the pictures of people with the uh, with the screen being shared. Uh, um, I see nobody at the moment, Mr Tate, thank you. Uh -huh. Maybe there'll be more questions uh, later, but I'd uh, carry on if I were you. Okay, so in terms of how much has been collected, and I'm, I put my hands up. I'm not the um, I'm not the absolute expert on this. We do have a SIL, um, a Section 106 and SIL monitoring officer, or well, we've actually got a vacant post for that. That uh, currently, um, but uh, approximately, um, as it says there, 3.73 million has now been collected since March, um, as of March 2020. So that's nearly a year ago. That's on the basis that. That, that's when our last monitoring um, was published. Um, and I think what's important to note there is the receipts have been steadily increasing. Um, so actually, when I first started looking, sort of effectively the year after SEAL, we'd probably collected about £20,000, following year £80,000, then it starts getting into the hundreds of thousands of pounds. And that's reflecting the fact that obviously those applications granted since 2015, in many cases, there's a couple of years before they commence, and then the money starts, and then the, the, we start receiving the sale. And so, it, in, in some ways, it's not, it's, it won't continue as an exponential rate, but more and more funds are coming in through through um, community infrastructure levy. Um, it also reflects that we're getting quite a lot of starts on sites now, particularly with, with our bigger residential um, uh, residential schemes, um, and also we're into the next tranches in terms of our, our um, installments policies. Um, but as I say, whilst yeah, you know, it's 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 a reasonable amount of money, it's not a huge amount of money. Um, that's that's the gross figure. So um, an, an element of that, you know, between the 15 or the 25% um, proportion of that will have been passed to town and parish councils. Um, what we do do is publish and it's it's on the council's website we do publish every year a summary of seal receipts and this year um, there was a it was the first year but there was a requirement to publish an infrastructure funding statement so that actually includes details of both seal and the section 106 monitoring and broadly speaking it sets out what's been received and um, what is committed what is a what is uncommitted um, and what has been delivered. Um, this first infrastructure statement was, as I say, a sort of bare bones statement. It's the first one we've produced. Um, going forward, there'll be a lot more detail in terms of next year's. And um, in my own service, I've just appointed um, a principal planning officer who's responsible for, or key responsibilities are, are infrastructure um, delivery so there is more resource now um, in terms of supporting um, not just the overall monitoring but actually supporting the infrastructure delivery um, and, and getting involved in that so I think going forward we've got um, extra resource to be looking and, and knowing exactly where we are in terms of the um, delivery of infrastructure. So again I'll just if, if pause briefly on 
on that one just in case there was any comments um but say so maybe it's easier picking it as it picking it all up at, towards the end and there's only a couple more slides to go okay any more questions at this stage i see not yeah. continue please so in terms of our spending and priorities um as i mentioned they originally set out in regulation uh, one, two, three. Um, so that's why we, we often refer to this reg one, two, three list. Um, and that was part of the original examination and formal consideration when we introduced community infrastructure levy. Um, there are other examples of very complex and very detailed um, uh, lists. This was fairly high level with some specific projects. So flood risk management specifically referred to the Bridgewater Tidal Barrier um, and also Burnham-on-Sea and the high bridge flood defences. Transport and public realm very much was about the walking and cycling, public transport, um, the types of things where you would have normally expected lots of contributions from small developments to, to deliver. So it wasn't including things like um, transport infrastructure specifically needed to support a development coming forward in itself. Um, but we also referred um, directly to Celebration Mile um, and Burnham Town Centre improvements. Education, again, this was quite a significant change. So education, prime, well, early years, primary and secondary through SIL, um, the exceptions being that on some of the larger allocations of the local plan, um, so that was at West Bridgewater, East Bridgewater, and also at Brew Farm. Um, there was a requirement through Section 106 to contribute or to deliver primary school on site. And that just reflect the fact that they were large allocations. So the actual education provision for primary school was on site. Um, then the offsite sport and recreation, very similar to, to that was to replace the previous sort of tariff approach we had. Um, which um, in, in also used to provide monies for, on a cluster based approach. So that replaced um, those formerly known RLT two and three type uh, uh, funding. And the last bit was offsite green infrastructure. And we specifically referred to the Meads um, part there. Again, that's a specific project we'd identified. Um, as part of that one, two, three list, it, it also explicitly refers to 20% therefore of seal receipts being ring fenced to fund the Bridgewater barrier um, and that was on the basis that the previous tariff approach um, was uh, superseded and it was to give a sure a surety to the environment agency that we would still be collecting funding on the broadly at the same scale as we we previously committed to through through the tariff approach um, so now Whilst it was deleted in 2019, the actual requirement for 123 list, this still is effectively the current um, and, and only published list of infrastructure priorities um, that we have. Um, and if we're undertaking a more sort of fundamental review of um, SIL, then this would be something I think that would also be reviewed, but it would be more a case probably of actually putting more details on under the actual topics um, in terms of specific schemes. In terms of the governance, um, this is why we've probably got some money actually, is there is no, currently we do not have formal arrangements um, for the actual spend of SIL. Um, so, and it is a key task to be progressed. It's a key task which sits with myself or my 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 team. Um, and it is, uh, there, I'm sure we'll have some comments on this, but I know that are now becoming, now that they're, uh, for the first, so to say, sort of two or three years of SIL, there was very little money in the SIL pot, but now we are starting to build up some funding. There are starting to be at, well we're starting to need to introduce some form of governance in order that we can um, start delivering some of the critical infrastructure i think you know it, it's really important to note that in terms of the amounts that we're collecting it doesn't provide all of the funding to meet even the most critical of infrastructure um, but equally it can be extremely useful as part of match funding um, for additional opportunities and I, I came in on the conversation when we were talking about the um, town investment fund and that's a clear example where 
we're also seeking through other opportunities such as that or the leveling up funding uh, contributions for infrastructure because SIL certainly won't deliver all of our critical infrastructure. In terms of the governance, the way the form and there was a paper drafted probably about 18 months ago but you know hasn't been progressed but it it will envisage some form of panel um, uh, to consider bids. I think the, the critical issues will be around whether there is um, an element of delegated authority for smaller bids with with more significant infrastructure bids having to be formally approved by um, either by potentially even executive because you can imagine with those it, it becomes quite a key decision if we get a request from county council about a primary school that would probably take the substantive amount of uh of, of our sale receipts if we get a request for a primary school and a piece of highway infrastructure there needs to be a decision a, a, a decision sort of a mechanism as to which is going to be prioritized um, so that it remains a key task i will need to progress that in the early part of what of the next financial year um, as, as a matter of urgency uh, so again that's a brief a brief pause but it's probably worth if i just do the final check slide anyway because it's the, the final slide just talks about possible replacement um, and it is pertinent it is is that um the in particular through the um the planning for the future the perhaps the white paper on the um future of the planning um system there's a proposal in there that says uh about community infrastructure levy should be reformed to be charged as a fixed proportion of the development value above a threshold with a mandatory nationally set rate or rates in the current system of planning obligations abolished. So in a nutshell, because there's not much detail on what that actually really means, but it is replacing what is effectively a, the, the current community infrastructure levy and section 106 with a, a, a nationally set infrastructure charge. Um, so it is quite a fundamental um, change if that comes forward. Um, the idea that it's a flat rate, um, as it says, flat rate value charge set nationally and either a single or, or area specific rates, and none of us have any idea how that would be worked out and, and applied. Um, there's a reference in the white paper um, that says, you know, it would aim to increase revenue levels nationally when compared to the current system um, and revenues would continue to be collected and spent locally. Um, I mean, the, the the issue there to a degree is even if that is possible to increase it nationally, um, what we would be interested in is would it increase or even maintain what we are able to collect at a local level? And you know this has to reflect the fact that the viability is vastly different um, in an area such as Southwest, vastly different in um, areas of the north of England to, to what it is in the southeast of the, of the country. So um, it's we're awaiting any details on the white paper. Haven't there's been no announcements about the progress or the next steps on the white paper that I've been aware of. I think they were still actually working through all of the consultation responses um, and as a result of that initially um, we have paused any review of SIL um, and the relationship 106 and, and, and SIL but again in terms of my priorities going forward in the next year I think you know we could wait around for ages for a national review of SIL so we will progress with reviewing the viability and updating how we work SIL and 106 together and I'll wrap that all up with the um, proposals for the governance. So it's a quick sort of canter through um, SIL. It is as I say it is a very complicated system and just as a final observation um, and I don't know why this seems to be the case but I it feels as if actually through community infrastructure levy far from actually getting more out um, in terms of contributions towards infrastructure than we did under the sort of section 106 regime it 
in, in many ways it feels that we get less um, at the moment and that may partially reflect the fact that there's an awful lot of it of development is exempted um, from it and it's exempted through the regulations uh, so we can't do anything about about that um, so you know it, it it's there's a huge infrastructure funding gap that still probably only if we're lucky is probably touching the surface for about sort of 30 40 percent of what we need I've, it's probably helpful now if I, I'll, un, I'll, I'll take away my, I'll stop presenting. Um, okay, thank you. There, there's two questions in the chat box already. Councillor Finneran has asked a question, but maybe he'd like to uh, come and ask it directly to Mr. Tate. To Councillor Finneran. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, uh, hi, Nick. Um, it was it, it was really just asking whether we've got any idea as to when we're likely to get a mechanism in place for spending CIL. Um, on the basis that it's got a 10 year life, as I understand it, or am I, or am I misunderstanding it there um, on the, you know, if uh, CIL that was collected in 2015 um, could effectively um, time out by 20, 2025. Um, in terms of the timing, I, I'd have to have to check on the, the regulations. I wasn't sure if that's the case, but um, if as I say, as it happens, those early years, those early two or three years was was very minimal amount. But, um, you know, it's going to be an action. It's going to be one of the key actions for my section to progress. So I, you know, I, I hate to say, oh, within six months, it might be shorter than that, but it, it needs to be done in relatively short order um, because there is now I'm aware of local projects, smaller projects, a number of them that are saying, well, actually, is there a mechanism even for for, for having a small amount of sale, even £10,000 to match fund a project or something. So um, I, I will progress or and now I've got an additional some additional resource in my in my service because we've, we've filled a post. Um, we'll certainly be looking to progressing it in, in the next couple of months and hopefully get draft reports to certainly SLT in the first instance. Um, so yeah, priority for the next within the next six months. Okay, thank you. So 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 maybe revisiting that mechanism within a few months' time to give you a um, a time scale to work on would be useful, Nick. Do you think? Uh, <laughs> uh, give me. <laughs> well, it may, but yes, yes, I'm sure it would be. It it would be. It's because everything becomes priority. That's the problem. But um, it this this is outstanding as a as as a. As, as an action so um you know i think it'd be reasonable to say you know that if you wanted to check even just as a, a short how is that progressing that would be fine but, yeah. yeah okay thank you uh councillor filmer thank you a couple of questions if i could nick um firstly you you said that we've got this funding statement which basically gives us the background as to what happens each year with the money coming in um i think from looking at the one that was attached on the appendix there's about three million currently in the pot roughly uh, um is there any record that we have as to what the pending amount is because as you said it's been growing as, as new sites come in is there any way that we can know what's likely to be coming forward in future years a uh, couple of other questions as well um record of how it's spent um we obviously as as the district council have that record and i know as the parishes are asked to account when they spend sill back to us so is that published that someone can see what where all the sill has been spent both by the district the towns and and the parishes um also sill obviously as you know was was introduced as a sort of compensation for local areas to help them accommodate new development as as you know from our own experience um it's not always that easy to to get that funding particularly if the highways authority or the education authority don't necessarily agree with the priorities of the local parish so how can we try and address that and and the final thing which you sort of touched on was this national rate possibly coming in how on earth does that work for a west country authority um when we're already having developers screaming viability at us on on every site that we have coming forward at the moment okay um the in terms of the what's pending um i mean a we do we we would know what um uh, notices, civil liability notices have been been issued. So actually, it is information which um, 
we we do have and i i think going forward one of the key usefulness as, as well in terms of a funding statement um bear in mind you know we we did you know we we did a bare bones statement this time but actually the, the where it becomes more useful is identifying what funding is is coming forward what the gaps are and we can actually use that for a bit for forecasting or in some cases as you know to a degree we the council took the decision not against the seal receipts but you know if we're thinking about borrowing um to deliver forward fund a piece of infrastructure on the basis that we we know we've got accurate forecasting of when seal receipts are coming in so that's where it starts becoming more powerful and what one will find is in the next infrastructure funding statement it will be a lot fuller document um and again that's one of the roles that the um principal that we've uh, recently sort of appointed can start picking up um i do it all the time trying to work out what money might be available for a barrier and it's a bit scary because i need sort of 14 million pounds and i'm doing it on a scrap of paper and then losing that piece of paper so something that's a little bit it, it more sort of um structured in terms of that forecasting but it's definitely the information is there um i think in terms of the um and and again it will set out that the, the strength of it starts coming when it's also demonstrating what you are you know and and it's intended these these statements to show what you've spent or intended to spend um so you've already allocated your your seal towards projects the um the parishes my my understanding would be that would be that would be correct though that 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 funding statement can also pick up what the um meaningful proportion has been spent on because um there is a parishes do have to report um what they have spent it on so we can capture that that, that information um, and indeed I think we confirm because I've seen one recently we we would also confirm um, to a parish that what they're proposing to does meet the it's quite a broad but the broad definition of what 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 still can be spent on um, and again I think that's useful information useful information locally um, you know sometimes even local people don't realize what money you know there's been quite a lot of money perhaps spent in their local area and that that housing that came forward at least is having some tangible benefits. Um, in terms of the, um, yeah, I mean the prioritisation is 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 difficult, and I know, you know, in particular, it's um, things like education. We very much, you know, we would say very much it's evidence evidence based, but this is why I'd have to say this is one of the reasons why the governance. Um, you know we know it's a slightly tricky area as to how you do prioritize when you haven't got enough to go around um and there will be you know there could be in district wide there could be an infrastructure priority that's district wide which is actually critical um and therefore the seal well i'll be i'll be slightly controversial so i will say it, you know the seal collected in cheddar is is being used to fund um you know a junction improvement at bridgewater because in the overall picture that's you know that's that's sort of critical so it's that's why the governance isn't without its challenges and it's about getting a balance right i think so that you've got you so you're certainly ensuring there's some opportunity perhaps for smaller sums to be a, a delegated uh, sort of level where at least some some of the smaller awards can be made to local parishes um there may be big projects that still have to be you know sort of make make their case but um it i think it would be unreasonable and i think the local community would feel unreasonable if they're not necessarily getting anything um from development area but we're always going to have to try and be based on the on the evidence and if we take education department you know they they have forecasts um if if there's a reason to challenge those then i suppose it can be challenged but that's you know we we need to make decisions prioritization as much as possible on on an evidence basis um and yeah your final question i've just put a question mark saying i don't know um <laughs> about how the nationally but i think the big worry is um we had to you know yes it was a it, you know there was expense involved but we had to commission detailed viability work for our district to understand it so how on earth it could be done nationally um and simply and quickly i i don't know um and the worry is that you'll get at best you'll get average you know a southwest figure maybe used which again we even know within somerset there's and there's 
viability is very different in parts of, of Sedgemoor. Um, you know, we've got somewhere like Wedmore, which is now recognised as the most expensive, um, you know, sort of the, the place to live. So that reflects land values in Wedmore, which are going to be rather different to um, land values in, in, in Highbridge, let alone if we're talking about parts of South Somerset or Taunton. So um, we're just awaiting some, you know, any any indication of how that might how that might come in, which is why again going forward I will I will progress our review because we could be sitting here um, in 18 months, two years time, and that element's not being progressed or is quietly being forgotten, as often happens with things in white papers. Um, uh, did you want to come back, Councillor Filmer? No. Uh, Councillor Pierce. Thank you. Two questions. Thank you, Nick. Um, first of all, was around, I'm still not clear on the mechanism for drawing down SIL funding. So for those um, those he headlines that you, you put up there, is it for the groups, appropriate groups linked to those two projects contained within that list to come to you with a with a proposal which will then be considered or does it work the other way around that you then uh, are in liaison with those groups and discuss how SIL might be used? So that's, that's the first question and the other one is around, um, you mentioned that there will be a, a revised SIL and I'm just conscious as a member of planning um, that I'm, I'm, I, I'm imagining that the um, increased receipt of SIL funding is a, is a definite factor on persuading communities to um, to draw up neighbourhood plans at great time and expense. And it seems to me there's often a disappointment at the end of the process of the benefits that it brings. So it's um, really about how will these changes be communicated so that communities in the future can make a really informed decision and that expectations are not raised falsely. In in terms of the first question about uh, uh, this comes back to the fundamental that there isn't a mechanism, you know, there, there is not a formal mechanism yet for. Um, so although there's some specific projects listed um, in terms of priorities um, right this moment in time, other than on a individual and therefore slightly ad hoc basis, I suppose it, it there, there could be a decision made to consider a proposal, but it would have to, you know, I would have to take that to executive um, presumably as a, which is why the importance of putting a mechanism in place so that we're not just sort of starting to consider one off projects. Um, so that will be the thing that I need to prioritise and that will then, and that with that, that would set out. So we, for argument's sake, as, as we might say for projects up to, I don't know, let's say sort of, you know, Ten thousand pounds or something. There may be a very simple delegated um, mechanism. We used to have with the cluster. I sometimes used to be at those cluster meetings when it was VRLT free funding, where um, you know there, there was discussion by by those uh, uh, cluster groups as to what to prioritise that that sort of sport and recreation funding on. So you could see you, you could see that type of op sort of um, uh, approach maybe working for smaller. For, for smaller levels, um, but that's what I need to need to progress and prioritise. Um, in terms of the seal review, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm just very we're very conscious that the viability work well was effectively 2014. We did up so the seal, and that's when the seal rates were set. Um, whether or not, of course, there's any greater opportunities um, with it, but we would, I think, we would need to actually review the um, urban and rural split as well a little bit, if nothing else, just to reflect um, that, you know, the extent of the, um, shall we say, the urban areas has changed over the last sort of five or six years. Um, if we were reviewing that, there would certainly be consultation. Um, but I think it's that wider point about communities with um, perhaps a neighbour plan where they may be encouraged actually to uh, and support a neighbour plan because they get an increased level of of uh, contributions. Um, I'd have to say that it, that 25%, that additional 10% that a local community gets, you know, that is very much for the, the, the parish or a neighbour planning group, the parish or local community to be deciding what they want to do with that. And I think also 
early on that decision whether to do a neighbor plan is probably you know again for those local communities to decide well do they want to spend because it's not cheap necessarily producing neighbor plan or it's it's quite intensive in terms of resourcing um it with people or or consultants if you go down that road is it worth doing that if ultimately you're not going to be receiving a great deal more in community infrastructure levy because not a great deal is happening in your settlement or are you going to allocate sites be very positive about it and set out clearly because you can deliver benefits x y and z but the one thing is you know the local community they do get that 25 percent to spend in their parish whereas the 75 percent of sill comes into the district council pot and it isn't ring fence so it can be spent Let's say anywhere in the district and that's maybe where the disappointment will be because people will see a lot of development happening in their area and still feel that a lot of the infrastructure is being delivered elsewhere at the end of the day there's infrastructure demands are way out see what we can get through silver did you want to come back on that councillor pierce no any more questions from anybody at this point. Otherwise, I uh, thank Mr. Mistake for his presentation today. And the only thing I suspect came out of that was a, a request to get a, a mechanization mechanism prioritized by, say, what, early April, something like that. What? Um, <laughs> oh, oh, or a, a suitable time that uh, we, we feel is uh, appropriate and within your capabilities of your department. Yeah. Uh, OK, is everybody OK to note that report and, and with with um, thanks Mr. Say. OK, thank you very much for that and move on to the final business of the day then, which is the the work program. Uh, as you know, we don't have a dedicated scrutiny officer at the moment, uh, so we're being supported by democratic services in this and we currently don't have a work program beyond today that I've got any note of so we do need to set that ourselves um so are there, I do have several suggestions but I'm it's it's your committee everybody if you'd like to throw in some suggestions at this point it would be uh, uh, welcome would anybody like to uh, make a start uh I think that was a six month review on sale I've noticed there has come up. I'm sure people will be very happy for that. Uh, six months a bit lenient, so I thought, but OK. Um, and um, Councillor Filmer, is that yourself? Yeah, yeah, if I could, Chairman. It was just really to ask maybe Mr Taylor. Um, we used to get a, a, a forward plan as to what was coming up on the executive forward plan, and that gave us sometimes things that we could actually see that were coming down the track that was worth us looking at in advance of them actually hitting. That seems to have stopped, and I just wondered whether that's something that would be useful. You should still be getting those emails through to you as part of the um, um, notice of, of, of upcoming business. That's still emailed through separate from the agenda itself. So you should be still getting that kind of film. If not, I can make check that up for you. Uh, are members saying then they're, they're not all getting that? So that could be an action to make sure people get it, just to check that people are getting it. That would be. Uh, Quite one. Um, Layla has said she sent it every Monday, um, so people may just need to check that that they're receiving that. Uh, any other suggestions from anybody? Uh, uh, nothing. Nothing is leaping forward. Uh, I, I am aware that I've had a, re a request. It's a written question from uh, Councillor Methley for Wednesday to, as a follow up on the review of meetings and certainly possibly post COVID meetings. As, as regards online or um, or hybrid meetings, even and to update, I will answer that on Wednesday. Uh, but is that something that people feel we should be revisiting uh, in the the light of the um, run up to you know, the end of COVID in the late uh, 2170s, whatever it is? Uh, but we'll we'll do that. Um, so that that's one item. Um, another thing, uh, I've I've often thought that we need a more visible review of the property investment board and the and the district's uh, investments and uh, uh, where we are with that. That's a, a, an important income generating item over a longer period for the council. Not everybody is, is uh, uh, aware of exactly what happens at those meetings, and um, although there's commercial sensitivities, nevertheless, I would suggest it's uh, something that we might like to look at. Is that somebody? Something people are happy with doing, yeah. Uh, Councillor Revens, I see your hand is up there. 
Uh, thank you. Um, we, we we had some entertaining scrutiny meetings at Somerset County Council where they commissioned some very expensive reports looking at the stronger Somerset uh, bid and um, uh, commenting on those. I, I wonder whether it might be might be appropriate for us to uh, commission some expensive re re reports on the one Somerset bid and, um, and, and similarly comment on on those or whether we consider that's not a good use of taxpayers money. Well, maybe we we could ask Democratic Services what capacity they have to match that uh, research project. Mr. Taylor, do you have a, an idea? No idea, Chairman. But I can probably find one out for you. Yeah, well, maybe if we can commission a, a not particularly expensive report back on that at some useful point, we we could uh, do that without spending much taxpayers' money on on the, the subject. Um, Obviously, we're, we, we usually have a review of the Quayside Festival at this time of year, but we haven't at the moment. And there's quite a few uh, events which we normally take for granted will be happening in our uh, district, but have been happening in different formats online or, or whatever. I, I would suggest that we do um, review that uh, uh, at some point in, in the near future, because we it is a key thing that we've funded over the end. I think maybe the initial funding stream is coming to an end on, on that one, are people OK with looking at that? I'm just looking for nods, really, that I, I have some. Fine. And um, other other things, um, there's a couple of key uh, extra regeneration projects that were flagged up in the budget this year, in, in the Bridgewater area in particular, um, notably the Summer Parade Hospital and, and the classic buildings in Penal or Lou. Uh, these are things that I think ought to be, people, members ought to, get a, a heads up of where they go, but there's certainly similar around the district too. So uh, sort of building based regeneration projects around the district could be another subject that I think might be useful uh, for 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 a, for review. And of course, and finally, I would suggest that coming out of coming out of COVID, um, we have introduced this uh, wardens system and uh, general measures for recovery. Is that something that members feel we could have a more of a specific look at. I do know that obviously the drop-in sessions, we do get updates about that. Uh, but in the format of a public committee meeting, I think they, that might be a useful subject as well. Would people be OK with that? Good. That's a, a window full of nodding people. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, any other ideas from anybody around here? Other, otherwise, that's a reasonable list that, that we have and we can uh, uh, myself and, and the vice chair can discuss with the uh, democratic services how we progress them on the various agendas. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for attending today. I, I declare the meeting closed. Thank you. <laughs>